Hey everybody, this is Paul, and it's been about nine months since we met Gary Matsuoka at Laguna Hills Nursery. Hopefully you saw that video. And today we're gonna talk about how I pot my dragon fruit, and this is what the potting soil looks like now that I use. So these are basically Gary's top pot, Gary's best top pot ratios. And I've repotted this whole section in the past nine months, and you can see just how happy these plants are. Here's an unknown, it's probably sugar dragon. And then here's voodoo child is going crazy right now, you can see. I got plenty of pollen and I hand pollinated these last night and they smell great. So if you just have a few pots of dragon fruit, I recommend just buying Gary's Best Top Pot if you can. It's about $20 a bag. So it's much cheaper for me and you can see how many I've repotted. It's way cheaper for me to make it myself. So this is how I do it. This is what it looks like first. And it's beautiful. So what I do first is I roughly estimate about 30% peat moss. I like the Omri certified stuff. And I usually put that in the pot first. So Gary's ratios are 35%, if I remember correctly. I do about 30% and replace 5% peat moss with coconut core. How much are the is a bag of the peat moss right now? Uh, it's about 14 bucks from, I get it at Home Depot or Lowe's. I actually, this one is the Home Depot brand and I prefer the Lowe's brand. It's a white uh, bag and it's three cubic feet, I believe. So, so you can get a pretty good amount for not that much. Oh yeah, for 15 bucks you get this huge bag. So I'll just do a quick mix, that's about 30%. Next up, I like to use pumice. And I really like this brand of pumice. So not all pumice is the same. And this is really good stuff. I get it at a local gardening center. It's about 14 bucks a bag. And you could actually go a little heavier on the pumice. Pumice is really good for aeration and it does not retain too much moisture. So I mix about that much. Then coconut core. And I make sure I get the chunky stuff that is ready, pH balance seven and washed. Because if you're not careful, it will have a lot of salt content, which you don't want. So it seems like coconut core is hard to find these days. And I mix about 5% of using this in the, in the mixture. And where do we get our coconut core? Well, it's been hard to find, so I actually get this on Amazon. And I'll put a link in the description so you can buy it yourself. And some people actually use the coconut core that is for reptiles, but they wash it out really well. So I don't have time to wash it out. I like to make sure I get the stuff that is ready for plants. And again, it's gotta be this chunky stuff, not the real fine stuff you get at Home Depot. That stuff retains way too much moisture. And I like this a lot. I mean, Gary, this is one thing that Gary did not agree with me on using it in the potting soil. He said it's too new, but every time I repot dragon fruit, the roots are just attached to the coconut core. So I really think it's good stuff. And again, it's just roughly about 5% by volume. And again, I just, I just estimated, I've done this so much that I just eyeball it. Now up next, I like to add perlite. And not all perlite is the same. This yeah. is some decent stuff, but different it's really sizes, small. Different sizes, different oh, sizes. Yeah. And so the problem with this one is I like to add a little bit of it. As you can see it's small, but I'd rather pay a bit more and go to my local hydroponics shop and get the number three, where they even have number four, which is even larger. So I try to get the three and the four whenever I can. Let me just show you the differences. These are big chunks. You don't want to breathe the dust, by the way. But you can see just the difference. Yeah, there's different. So I prefer the bigger stuff over the really fine stuff. It just kind of turns to a powder over time. So let's see, we did peat, peat moss, we did pumice, we did perlite, we did coconut core up next, sand. Yeah, this is Gary's favorite. Yep, and so I was using a different brand of sand, but a lot of the rare fruit growers recommend using this paving stone paver sand. You gotta make sure it's washed. It is washed and it's really fine. It's not as fine as other sand, you see it's got some nice grains to it. So I just throw in one bag of sand every time. How many pots does this make? I have no idea about 
uh, over 20 gallons, I would say, when I fill this up. But I just, I do this all the time. And last but not least, I add some of this biochar. Where do you now, get that, Amazon? I've seen it on Amazon or online for cheaper. It's Armory certified, as you can see. But I got this locally at a, a soil shop and it was 45 bucks a bag, so okay. it's pricey. And you only use about 5%. Okay. So just like that. So next step is I give it a good mix really well. And if you saw, I actually left some of my mixed potting soil like this, I left it at the bottom of this barrel just because it requires a lot of effort to mix it and you want it really, really mixed up well. You wanna get that biochar in there, you wanna get the sand spread out. You don't want too much peat moss because although peat moss is acidic, dragon fruit prefer a slightly acidic soil and we have an alkaline water. So between our watering and our with our hard water, which is alkaline, and the acidic peat moss, I've noticed it's just really, really good for the dragon fruit. They really enjoy this medium. So I could keep mixing it and show you that. And that's a little boring. I just want to show you what it looks like, the finished product. So there it is. So I pot my dragons in this potting soil. It does retain some moisture, but it has plenty of aeration. So you want to get the oxygen to the roots. That's the key. So once we have this in a, once we have a potted dragon, let me show you now how I fertilize it uh, in 2022 and what I've learned about fertilizing. Okay, so this is how I'm fertilizing the dragon fruit now. Honestly, you can just top dress with this. This is Dr. Earth's uh, Flower Girl Bud in Bloom. Hopefully you've seen our video on that that we did last season. And it's really, really a great organic Omri certified fertilizer. So honestly, you can just top dress your dragon fruit with this. But now this is what I'm doing. I'm actually using Fox Farm, which I believe Gary described it as the Cadillac of potting soil, but it's best for top dressing. So what I'll do is I put a little bit of Fox Farm potting soil into a five gallon bucket. And then I mix this Dr. Earth's Flower Girl Blood, Bud and Bloom. Yeah, Bud and Bloom was was told to us by uh, Leo from Oceanside Dragon Fruit, yes. right? Yeah. yeah, you're right. Don't breathe it. But I mix it up really well, about 50-50. And he said he liked to put this on in the spring, right? To make his dragon he, fruit he bloom, it, right? He did it twice, and the second time was by June, if I remember correctly. Okay. But basically, right when the dragons wake up, I top dress with this. And then, again, right in June. I'm actually prefer to do, like, first, of, first week of June. I'm a little behind this year. But once it's mixed up about 50-50, this is what it looks like. Okay. And so now, here's Paul Thompson's 6S, very important variety, and it needs some extra nutrients. So I just top dress near my drip irrigation. And I'll water it in. And I water it in the same day. So that's more than enough. I usually do about two handfuls per pot. And hopefully we'll have some more of these flower buds, as you can see. Look at this beautiful missing variety, Paul Thompson's 6S. That's going to open soon. It will. And there's actually another one here. So we want plenty more and we want this growth here. What I'm actually noticing is after I fertilize it the way I just showed you and water it in a few times, they're much greener plants. You can see there's a little stress, a little yellowing on this one. So as soon as I apply this fertilizer, these plants get a nice, beautiful dark green and they're much happier. And they tend to shoot flower buds as well. So there you go. That's what I'm doing this season for potting soil and fertilizing. Greetings fellow dragon fruit growers, this is Paul and today I'm going to show you how I root young cuttings. Now ideally you want a nice mature cutting like this 8S here that's really thick, has a nice core there, it's really developed. But sometimes you're going to get something like this, which is this black dragon. You can see it's a really young, immature core and soft, kind of leathery. This is not ideal because that's going to be more sensitive this winter in my climate in zone 9B in Southern California. So here's another example. This Medusa is really immature. So you want to be really careful with how you root these because they're definitely more sensitive and less forgiving than a, a mature cutting. So let me get started. Let me show you how I'm rooting these this season. Let's go into the greenhouse and I'll show you my st simple steps to get these things to thrive. So there are several different strategies you can do to root your dragon fruit cuttings, but what I like to do this time of year 
is just use regular potting soil, as you can see. And I barely put it in to the potting soil and I tie it up onto some bam a bamboo stake. And then I water the flesh just like that, really lightly without getting it too wet. And I just do that a few times a week and I tend to get roots in about two weeks. Now this season, I'm working with Vermistera and they asked that I try this out and I'm actually dipping the cuttings in Vitality. You can see here I have this little bucket and I just soak them in there for a few hours and then I do the same thing that I just showed you. Here's a really tender Kathy Von Arum. And so what I like to do is just slightly put it in the soil, tie it up, and again, just spray it ever so lightly a couple times a week. And that's been really successful for me. You can see here in the greenhouse, you could do this outside under a tree as well. You don't have a greenhouse or even on the side of your house that doesn't get sunlight. And I just let them stay here where they get very little direct sunlight, if no, actually none. And I just let them sit here for a few weeks and you can see, I could do a pull test and the roots are starting to develop on all these. And as they root, I put them over here where they gradually get more sunlight. You can see I even have a flower bud on this rooted cutting here on Yala number one. So what I like to do is the pull test. Once it's rooted really well, then I'll actually take it outside and slowly introduce it to more sunlight. So there you go. That's what I'm doing this season to root dragon fruit cuttings and I've had zero issues with rot. It's been 100% successful with actually all sorts of different plants you can see here. They're all using the same potting soil. Greetings fellow dragon fruit growers. This is Paul and today I thought I'd show you how I root my cuttings in the winter and knock on wood, I've been 100% successful this season so far. Now, I was using distilled water, but now I'm just using my tap water and I'm letting it sit out on the heating pad for a few days to let the chlorine dissipate. I've tried using glass mason jars. These ones work really well. Although that one should be straighter. I'll fix that later. But you can see this baby Serato has a prolific amount of roots on it. Look at that. So it's doing just fine. And in fact, in pure water, in fact, it's actually got some new growth here, see it? And it's not even under the grow light. Now I do leave this grow light on for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's just some cheap one my friend gave me. It works just fine. I do have some somatic grafts in here, you can see. That one's successful. Both of these are, but this one, the natural mystic side has rotted. So it very well could just be a success, but either way, it's fun to experiment and see. I do regret doing that graft in the fall. I would prefer to, I'm gonna do more in the spring. Now you can see I have plastic cups and Tupperware, and I've even applied and mixed earthworm castings into the water. As you can see, it looks really dark and gross in there, like slime, but that's actually earthworm castings. And they work really well. You can see here, 6S, I broke off, it's a young cutting, flesh to stem cut, and it's got a prolific amount of roots. It's ready to be transplanted. So all in all, it's just been a great season. Here you can see some more roots coming out on this total eclipse, which I'll explain more about the story of this plant in the future. It's actually a California rare fruit growers variety, I believe, but we'll tell you more about it soon. Now this looks pretty gross, but this is just a little bit of earthworm castings that have been in there for a few months now. And I'm not getting any rot and these cuttings just keep growing and sprouting and new roots and doing fine. Now I think it's key to have a temperature controlled thermostat. Now you can see it's a little cold in on, on this right now. The temperature is cold and it's because it's about 65 degrees in the garage. Now, when it warms up, it's generally gonna be set to 85 degrees and it will be 85 degrees most of the day. Now you can see I keep the temperature probe underwater all the time to keep it an accurate temperature. And I'm just getting so many roots. It's just been great. So this combination of a grow light and a heating pad has just been awesome. You can see this Jade Red even thinks it's spring. So getting lots of new growth even above the grow light. 
Here's one of my seedlings that I had removed from a graft. It's really long, about three or four feet, and this thing is rooted as well, despite being a young branch. So there you go. Once I'm done with this, I put them into the greenhouse that's unheated, and I water them once a month, so very, very little water. So I highly recommend this setup if you can do it or have the space because you can see you just get roots in a very short amount of time. Good morning. Today I'm going to teach you how to water your dragon fruit. Now dragon fruit are actually epiphytic night blooming cacti and they're very drought tolerant once established. This plant would survive here on just rainfall alone but it would never flower or fruit. And dragon fruit have a special adaptation, and it's called CAM, C-A-M, CAM, photosynthesis. And what that basically means is that their stomata will open at night. So in here, the stomata will open at night, and they basically delay the timing. They change the timing of photosynthesis, which is amazing to me. So in Paul Thompson's book, he talks about a friend that was using drip irrigation and having great success. So I use drip irrigation and I water during the growing season every other day, just for a short duration in the evening, because the best time to water your dragon fruit is actually around 10 o'clock after the soil cools. Now in this case, I watered these recently and uh, I notice when it's time to water, the soil will come dry up a bit and there'll be a little gap between your pot and your soil and that means that's when I know it's time to water my dragon fruit. So I don't need to water this anymore but I do want to show you I will additionally do a, a drenching and I'll use either a compost tea or just the hose water and I water it about 7 to 14 gallons per week for this 20 gallon pot. Now, Linda Nickerson used about five to seven gallons a week on her mature plants and said that was sufficient. So, again, I use about seven to 14 gallons of water during the growing season. Now, in the winter, I don't water at all. I only let rainfall uh, water the plants, but I do run the drip if it's going to be a frosty night because uh, wet, mo moist soil will retain more heat than dry soil. So that's a good tip. So I only water during a really cold time of year to keep the plants from freezing. All right, let me go show you in the greenhouse. All right, so here's the greenhouse. And basically this section is my rooted section. So anything rooted, whether it be grafted or not, I have them in this side of the greenhouse. And I will water them really heavily almost every day. So I usually actually use a smaller one, it takes longer, but I really want to show you how much water I like to give them. So definitely a lot of water, about every other day to every day. I would say five to seven times a week, depending on the heat and the temperature in our area. Now on the other side over here, I have the non-rooted section. So most of these are just barely getting rooted some are very hard to root, like yellow cross 68 or yellow tie. So what I will do is I'll just give them a lot of really light watering, but mostly on the plant flesh. So again, mostly on the plant flesh until they will root. And I use a bit of rooting hormone, which I hope you've seen our episode on as well. And then I'll check them every week or so. So some of them just take their time. So that's what I do, a much lighter watering on my uh, new cuttings that I'm rooting and again mostly on the plant flesh. Hey everybody this is Paul and today I'm going to show you how I build a permanent dragon fruit trellis. I use concrete rebar and four inch drain pipe and I'll show you all the steps and I'll show you why. I mean you can see how sturdy it is. I have one of my hybrids here and these things just don't break. I mean, you can see here it's 4S and it's just something that's very permanent, a permanent solution because we get some winds here and I don't want them to fall over and get top heavy. So you can see here's the older design, Spicy Exotics design, and this is where it's in a hollow four inch drain pipe. And what happens is in time, they just bend over. 
And you can see after a few years, I did these in 2019, they almost just kind of flex at the base. So I had to start using a bamboo post to keep them level. But as the plant gets heavier, you can see it just bends more and more and more. And so this is not a good long-term solution. And I don't want to use wood because I, I just want these to get really large and just hold hundreds of pounds. So you, you've iterated these dragon fruit trellises a bunch of times. So what, what version are you on? How many times have uh, you reassessed what, how you made them? Probably like three or four times. I've tried three inch drain pipe, which I thought was a little thin. And I noticed that four inch drain pipe is better because I can put four cuttings in a pot. So this is a 20 gallon pot and I put four on a four inch drain pipe. It seems to work really well. I have some three inch drain pipes down there and they're just too narrow. So that one inch larger diameter is key. Maybe we can put all the parts in the description. Yeah, kind of we can do that, no problem. And so let's go through the steps and I'll show you how I build these. Let's go get started. Okay, so step one is selecting the correct location. So I'm about seven to 10 feet from other pots. And most of my trellises are about 10 feet apart. Some are about seven feet, but that's the minimum. So how deep are you gonna go? I go about two feet. So step one is I, you want to dig a hole about two feet deep. And I expect to use about a hundred to 120 pounds of concrete. Okay. So let me get this dug and I'll show you the next step. Okay. I have the hole dug and this is my tool of choice here. And what I buy is half inch rebar at 10 feet. So this is a 10 foot piece. I cut it with a bimetal cutting blade and then I make, I use, I use it to cut a six foot piece, which will be the main spine, I guess you could say, main support, which I'm about to hammer it into the hole. And then these will be the cross beams. So that's why I like to buy 10 foot sections because I don't ha have any waste. And then I use half inch um, drip line and I sheath it. So that way you'll see why, because that way I can remove them from the top and interchange them or move the plants. So I have the rebar, I hammer it in until it's about four feet in height. Try to keep it centered and level. And that looks about good. So it's about four foot, one inch. So one more hit. There we go. Next up, this is the four inch triple wall drain pipe. And I cut this to a six foot piece. You can see it's too tall. So now I'm gonna trim it back just a bit. And I usually go one inch beyond the rebar. So the rebar is five feet in height. So now I'll cut this five foot one. So 61 inches. I'm using that same metal blade. There we go. Next up, I put in a four inch cap and I use this drill bit. It's a unibit. I go straight through. I'll let that whip you in the face. I try to make it a 90 degree angle. I just eyeball it. Sometimes I go through the, the uh, cap twice, but usually I just go right under it. And there we go. So now I have that done. Now it's time to get to the concrete. So let me get the concrete ready and show you the next step. So what I like to use is the fast setting concrete and I'll use anywhere from 100 pounds to 120 pounds per pot, per trellis. And the reason why I like How many this, bags is that, like two? Two, a little over two, depending on the hole. 
but usually two is plenty. And what I like to do is mix it up really well. It's definitely too wet there. Yeah, you don't need much. You just need a bucket and some water. Yep. And a stick. <sighs> nice. Don't want to breathe it, by the way. It's really bad to breathe the dust. And I like to have it kind of like consistent and similar to cake batter. That's great, you know. Definitely more on the thinner side. So next I like to fill up the base first. Oh, we can just dump it. And use the rebar. Get any of the holes, air hole pockets out of there. And work it in. And again, this is fast setting, so it'll set pretty quick. You want to make sure it's nice and level before the concrete sets. That's very important. And it does set pretty quickly. Then, I like to use the rebar. And that'll kind of help keep it where I want it to. I think in this case, probably something like that. Okay, there we go, nice and level. And you'll want to check that a few times. And just fill it up. Makes a very cool sound when it plops down. And it takes about one bag to fill up this kind of drain pipe. So around 50 pounds of concrete. Yeah, once you do this a few times, it gets pretty easy. Yeah, and you want to pull that rebar and get it in the center. Okay, so I filled it up and now time is of the essence. So the first step down here is the concrete. You want to make a nice level base. That way it'll prevent any gophers from entering the pot. And you'll see I'll cover this with some dirt and allow the roots to grow into the soil. But having a nice level base is really important. So like that there. Now, I'm gonna double check, make sure it's still level. Yep. Perfect. And now you don't wanna wait too long. Before it hardens, you don't want it to harden, that'd be bad cap on. And then insert these straight through. And this half inch drain pipe, drip irrigation line, excuse me, is key because it acts as like a sleeve. And so as it cures in the next hour or so, I'll just turn it like this every so often. And it'll just form your mold so you and can put that in later. Makes the perfect mold, exactly. Let's make sure it's still level. It's the most important step. Yep. And so now, over here, you can see what it looks like when it's done. So, I've added the dirt, the concrete pad is still under there. And then now, I'm gonna finish the top. So you can see, but these will still go in and out after it dries relatively easily. So sometimes it's bent or curved, so you might have to flip it over. But there we go. So you can see how easy it goes back on. You can see for the 20 gallon pot, I like to drill a lot of holes. And I put that nice open center in it, put it down. And then, I like to use this wire mesh you buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. It comes in a big eight foot by four foot or something like that. And I think I make four out of them on each piece. So I cut them and 
tie them down with zip ties and it looks like this over here when it's done. And then you add the burlap. Yep. So I like to build the top and then I add a, plenty of burlap around it. Why do you add the burlap? That way the aerial roots will have something to grab onto. I've seen some people use uh, sandpaper to make it more rough, the PVC, and you can do that as well. Okay. But I prefer to just let it be and put plenty of burlap on it. And I just use some larger zip ties or you could use wire or twine. And there you go. Next step is I like to form a little base of perlite. So I add a perlite about four inches and then put in potting soil and it's good to go. And so after a while, I'm gonna redo all these that's down this whole row. And I'll show you what here's the Laverne Pink looks like when it's all said and done. So something like this. And then time, some of the older ones will just get those aerial roots and really just- Yeah, you have an example of the aerial roots? Or is there's, uh, there's some here. You can see how they're going some of my older burlap. pots, I've moved most of them, so not in this section. That's a good example. Yeah. And there you go. And they're sturdy. They can take a lot of weight and I don't have to worry about them falling in the winds or anything. And I couldn't be happier. So I'm getting rid of all the white ones and they're all gonna be 20 gallon black pots. And you can see, I've probably done 80 of these already. Yeah, like that, 50. you're experimenting so other, so other people don't have to. Yep, so that, that's been working really well for me. I'll never have to deal with rot or have any problems. Greetings, fellow dragon fruit growers. This is Paul, and today I'm gonna to talk about snails and slugs and what they do to dragon fruit. Now, in the springtime, these snails come out first overnight and they leave first thing in the morning. So I like to come out early in the morning and exterminate any snails that I can find. You can see there's another one there before they hide in their little layers. I saw another one over here, there it is. And so the reason why you wanna remove these snails and exterminate them is because they're gonna cause a lot of damage to your young growth. You can see some damage there. They're gonna eat the tips of your new branches And cause a lot of damage to your new growth which you really don't want to do because it's gonna stunt your plant so there's a few treatments you could do the best thing would be sluggo by Monterey it's OMRI certified organic as you could see that's the brand I like to use if it gets out of hand your second strategy you can see here I put some DG around the pot and that worked great for a few months until it rained a bit and it washed away so now the Snails can go right around it. They don't even care. You can see it's going down this plant here to retreat. Now, they're not just gonna eat things like hay. They're gonna eat other varieties too. You can see here, this wrong Maria Rosa, they love to eat this one for some reason. See the damage? There's even, they even ate entire holes through that branch, which I'll probably prune off. So it's really important this time of year to police your plants. You can see when there's dew from the fog the night before, that is what allows them to be slimy and cruise around and that indicates that they're gonna be on your plants first thing in the morning. So I really don't like snails and you can see why, look at all the damage that they cause. But that's a fact of life when you live with a lot of plants like I do here. Now, some of the snails will live under that area and even into those irrigation little covers. I found snails in there. Let's see if there's some in there today. Here's one that they like to be in. Yep. So again, snails like to hide everywhere in your garden. It's very important that you take care of them so they don't damage your lovely, lovely new branches and set you back another season. Now, in addition, what I like to do is I check and remove any weeds around the pots. So I haven't done that one yet, but just doing something like this and weeding around the pot is a great deterrent for these snails. In addition, the snails like to hide right up under these spots here in your pot, if you use pots. So just be aware, you can see that the snails are causing a lot of damage in this area. 
especially on my young new growth, which is really frustrating. Right here. So that's why every morning I'm coming out to exterminate these snails. Hey everybody, this is Paul, and I'm gonna share with you what I've learned about cold weather and dragon fruit. So hopefully you've seen our video that two years ago we used incandescent lights and a tarp. So Christmas lights and under a tarp, you can see here, and it was pretty successful and that will buy you a few degrees. Now, what I've learned over the years now is that I tend to not do much until temperatures dip below 40 degrees. So we've had some frost here recently. You can see here in this photo, and it was really cold. It was down to 33 degrees in that photo. Now, last night it wasn't so cold, but just for demonstration purposes, you can see I'm now using the blanket. I got this on Amazon. We'll put in a link below, you can check it out. And it's designed to protect plants from frost. And what I like about it is we're not associated with it in any way or not, but I like that it's breathable. And that's a good key feature. It's water resistant and it works well for me. I've been covering some plants to protect the new growth. You can see here, this is Cosmic Charlie and Nitzel. And this one had a nice, some new growth and I just wanted to protect it from the last bits of bouts of frost. So you can see it's under here and it's not aborting. So it's doing just fine. Uh, I tend to protect things like American Beauty and Guatemalan varieties. They tend to be a bit more sensitive. Same with Pelora in my experience. And over here I have some Columbiana and a Desert King seedling. So what typically happens here is the fruit could abort, but in this case they're doing fine. I did lose a natural mystic fruit last week due to the cold weather, but this is what always happens is the new growth will kind of freeze off, turn yellow and break, apart, break, break off. So it will just stop the new growth. You can see here, luckily, like these tips, it didn't get quite cold enough here. So the, the frost did not affect, the cold weather did not affect this desert, desert king seedling. Now I do have a, a damaged American Beauty or some type of similar plant, it's an unknown. And let's go check that one out and I'll show you what uh, frost damage looks like. So this is a different section on the property here. And you can see it's a little bit colder in this part of the yard. So here's some new cold damage. This is one of George Emmerich Jr.'s hybrids. And you can see it's just getting really stressed out and damaged from the cold. It will start to yellow as well, but this is telltale sign of fresh cold damage. Now what happens after a few weeks is if it continues, the yellow will turn to rot. So let's go down here. I'll show you another variety that's rotted out. And we'll, well, actually here's another one with some cold damage. So I have three. So this is a polyrhizus and you can see it's just discolored. It's not happy. And so this plant is being affected by the cold too. And we've had, again, about a week of really cold weather, 10 days of cold weather, and this is all fresh damage. So down here, you can see some of my hybrids that I'm evaluating. Seedlings grafted and ungrafted. And I kind of put them here on purpose because I want to see how resilient they are from the cold weather. You can see this is yellowing, and this is all from that recent cold weather. This is an Asunta seedling. So I grafted it, uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so. Now, the one that has the most damage on the property is actually in one of the lowest parts of the yard. And so I'm assuming all the cold air has drained down here and kind of sat in this spot. And so this is very similar to American Beauty, which is a sensitive Guatemalan variety. And you can see what happens. So it'll turn yellow and eventually lead to this rot. You can see I'm going to have to remove this whole plant. Well, at least this whole branch, I should say, not the plant. So I'm going to cut it a little bit below the rot and I'll be better about protecting this from the frost. So that's what damage looks like from cold weather. And again, certain dragon fruit are more resistant, uh, resilient to the cold weather versus something more sensitive like an American Beauty or a Guatemalan. Now, fresh and young cuttings, you wanna do something else. So let's go up to the greenhouse and I'll show you how to protect those new cuttings and unrooted plants. Hey, so this is inside the unheated greenhouse here, I slash tool shed. And what I do is I put all of my unrooted cuttings in, that are in soil or they barely have roots on this left side. So they get a little bit more warmth and sun throughout the day and they will root even if it's in the middle of winter. See, they're getting a little bit of roots. So you just gotta be patient here. This is a 3S. And over here on the right are ones that I usually will put outside once it's warmer. You can see I have an Antimoya tree. Look at this mango in here as I protected this new growth. So I'm really excited to 
keep that safe in here. And once it warms up a little bit, I'm gonna take all of these and put them out into more sunlight. So all of these have roots and I tend to let the cuttings develop roots. It takes, I give them about 180 days. We learned that from Oceanside Dragon Fruit. So Leonardo there recommends that they typically will keep their plants in a one gallon pot for about half a year to root and then they transplant them. So that's kind of my strategy to protect them from frost. Hey everybody, this is Paul, and today I'm gonna to show you how to prune and tip your dragon fruit plants. You can see here, it's just after the summer solstice, and this Edgar's baby, I did zero pruning on it, just as an experiment to see what would happen. And of course, there are zero buds, zero flower buds. So what these plants do is they respond well to stress. And so I'm gonna stress them out today and start pruning back growth that I don't want. So you can see here, small branches that are not very big. I'm gonna go ahead and just tip some of these younger branches that are long to get them to stop growing. And I'm really gonna to have to prune some of this growth off heavily here to induce flower buds. I fertilized it and now this is a next step. And I actually probably should have done this earlier in the season but again, this is an experiment. I wanted to see what would happen. And as you can see, nothing but a bunch of new healthy growth. So we're gonna prune some of this off, clean it up today, and we're gonna induce some flower buds here, hopefully. Now this plant did produce several fruit last season. So what I like to do is just really clean it up a lot. Now, if you're looking, what you see here is in Paul Thompson's Pitahaya book, that he had several examples of people that would do something similar here. The Israeli visitor that he talks about uh, said that these plants will flower if you cut them back. Alice Snow did the same thing and Jose Lopez actually cut back all of his branches six to eight inches. So I like to have longer branches, uh, longer the better, but anything over six inches will produce a fruit. Don't forget about your boy, Danny. Oh, that's true. What did Danny say? I forgot. He said to tip your branches at- At a 45, 45 degree, degree angle. Yeah, that, that's true. Towards the north or something, right? Uh, yeah, at an angle, but especially so you don't get water to sit on top of where, um, where you tip it. So in this case, you can see all these branches are bending down. So tipping it at a 45 doesn't really matter, but you can. I mean, you could even just tip it with your fingers like that. But I like to use clean shears. So let's go through this plant here quickly and see kind of how I would prune it and why. So you can see most of, most of these branches are bent over the trellis, which is what you want. And the, the, the branches that are going to produce fruit are gonna be something like season two the or season growth. one, these older branches here that have matured. So this, you can see the difference on this Edgar's baby, young branch, mature branch. They seem to have a, a more of a dark green color to the older growth. Dark green color, thicker, and some of them you can see are quite large. So let's prune this back and let's see what we want to keep and remove. So this one has some holes in it, some bug damage. I'm just gonna remove the whole branch. And again, I'm just gonna tip some of this newer growth and the older growth. This one's not very long. And so you, the, be, you wanna basically make it stop pushing new growth and start pushing buds. Yes, exactly. So a lot of these younger branches, I'm gonna go ahead and tip off. Something like this, I would remove. Something here where there's bug damage, see that? And it's thin. So I'm gonna cut it just like that. This one's growing funky. So I'm just gonna remove it. Anything small like this. Yeah, you notice a lot of the branches, they, they'll they start growing and then they just kind of stop and they get all stubby and they don't really seem to do much past that. They do, or they get twisted. Kind of, you want to just take all those off. Yes, and you do just want to kind of open up the canopy a bit so you get plenty of airflow, or that way if you're worried about pests, you can keep an eye on them. So I'm just gonna continue to prune back this growth here and really, hopefully, coax this plant to produce some flower buds, which it will this season. Now, ideally, you do wanna prune these back. I would probably say April. April's a good time. And that way, 
you won't miss the first flush of flower buds and fruit. Now here's an interesting one. This is a mature branch. You can see how I tipped it and removed this growth here. So that's going to be kind of a twofold thing to where this growth is going to now be gone. And then I tipped it right at the end here on a mature branch to hopefully induce some flower buds. Let's come around here, Scott. You can see this one's kind of choking up in a weird spot. So I'm just going to remove it. And I'm going to continue doing this. I'll show you the after in a minute, but really quickly, I wanted to show you something like here. You can see I tipped it last season and I did not get a flower bud off of this branch. So I'm just going to tip it. Here's where Danny's comes into play. Tip it at a 45 and remove that new growth, but also tip that old mature growth. So hopefully what will happen is we'll induce some flower buds here right at the bottom. Now you can see over here why we tip and let these branches come over the canopy. You can see I tipped it here earlier at about April or maybe May. And look at this, three, flower, uh, three flowers and they've all turned to fruit. So tipping it after the branch comes over the canopy has really great results. So let's go finish Edgar's baby. I'll show you in just a minute what it looks like when it's all done. So you can see here, I've pruned back quite a bit. This is not just from the plant, but this is from a few plants. And I'm on my last one here, or two, to where I just want to give a, a little bit of, a little cut off the tip. Now come around here, Scott, you can see, here's one I tipped last season right here, but Danny would recommend something like this to where a mature branch here, even if you've tipped it and it hasn't produced flower buds yet, just a tiny little wound, just cut off a little bit like that. And that will also promote some, hopefully, flower buds. So you can see I have my work cut out for me. I had this whole row I left alone. So now the next plant, I'm gonna do the same and repeat the process here is on the Soul Kitchen White. You can see just how much work I have ahead of me to promote this thing to produce flower buds. So lots of small young growth I need to remove. So I, I've got my work cut out for me today, but that's how I'm pruning and tipping my branches to induce flower buds here this season in 2022. Give us a like and a subscribe. Thanks so much for your time. Have yourself a wonderful day. Take care. Good morning, fellow dragon fruit growers. This is Paul, and 10 days ago I did an episode on pruning and tipping your dragon fruit branches, and look at the results here 10 days later. Soul Kitchen White here has plenty of flower buds. It's like this on almost every mature branch. Now, in fact, I did this whole row here where I tipped and pruned them, and every single one that's mature has flower buds now. Look at this Edgar's baby. Up here we have flower buds, here, here, and basically everywhere. Now, if you have a young, immature plant that you tip like this one, you're just going to get new, new branches, new growth. This Edgar variety here has zero flower buds because it's just too young. Now here's some really old plants, and this one I tipped a little bit more than 10 days ago. So it's a bit more advanced, but you can see here, this is actually a Linda's Asunta, Elk Creek Asunta 2. And I moved this entire plant and look at all the flower buds. So these plants really thrive when they're stressed. They in induce flower buds. So a lot of sun damage or heat can result in these varieties producing flower buds. Now here's Spicy Exotics Nitzel. You can see I barely tipped it. Flower buds there. And I did prune it back quite a bit. And look at that, more flower buds there. Now another one, Cosmic Charlie, that I tipped 10 days ago. Flower bud. And look at all these flower buds right here. And it's like that on just about every branch. So really, really exciting here. 
There's a few more. Let's see, this is Nicaraguan red. It's already got some flower buds about to open. And I tipped it, and look at that, another new flower bud. Some more flower buds. This thing is just having one awesome season this year. So what I did is I fertilized June 1st. I tipped these plants June 30th, and now today it's 10 days later. No flower buds on country roads yet. It's a little bit too small, and that's a pleura in there. But look at this plant. Here's Maria Fusia. And it's actually on its third wave here. You can see wave one, lots of fruit. And then wave two, have some more flower buds. And then when I tipped a few of these branches 10 days ago, look at this, wave three. Lots of flower buds, even one over there. So tipping and pruning all that vigorous growth off of your dragon fruit can have some great results, as you can see. So give it a shot. We need some more. Look at all these flower buds. It's definitely working well for me. Greetings, fellow dragon fruit growers. This is Paul, and today I'm going to talk about varieties that you want to grow in your collection so you'll get some early pollen and early flowers. Now this is something similar to Sugar Dragon. You can see it was the first flower to open and it also set fruit, so it's self-fertile. You can see I have another flower bud on this immature plant as well. Now over here is Voodoo Child, which is also early to bloom. You can see I have several flower buds here. And another benefit is that this one is a great pollen source and it's also self-fertile. You can see I have quite a few different flower buds here forming. Now, in addition, some of the Guatemalan varieties like to bloom early in the season. And you can see that I have G2 here, and it has several flower buds on the plant. Now, it's mixed with a Soul Kitchen White, which has not produced any flower buds yet, but I'm sure it will in time. You can see the G2 is off to a really great start this season. Now let me go show you what else I have making flower buds. Let's go check it out. Now the wrong Maria Rosa, Maria Fusia, is off to a great start as well. I tipped some branches and you can see just how many flower buds it has. Quite a few here. It's off to a really, really great start. I like this variety a lot. It's a fuchsia fleshed fruit. It's been a really vigorous grower for me. Now, some people get some red fleshed varieties to produce, but for me, Kaslau is always the first one, one of the first to produce flower buds. Now, it only has one on it so far, but once it gets a little hotter, I'll expect to see a lot more. Let's head up to another section of the yard and I'll show you some more. Now this little flower bud is on Namibian orange. Not much is known about this variety, except for that it's been reported to produce a pink fleshed fruit. So I'm really excited to try this one. Not much is known about it. I hear it requires cross pollination. Now another one that blooms early for me is Bruni. And this one is self-sterile as well, so you need to cross-pollinate it. So Sugar Dragon is a great companion to Bruni. So that way you could use the Sugar Dragon pollen, store it, and use it on these flower buds here that are just coming in to maturity. See this one. Love the color on Bruni. Now we have some more flower buds coming in. Let's go check them out. And I've already had a condor bloom as well. I'll show you that in a minute. Now, my dark star was not doing so well this season, at the end of the season, into the winter, but it has a flower bud. This is probably my favorite, one of my favorite tasting fruits. That's Matt's Landscape Dark Star. Now, I also am getting my first flower buds on Paul's Laverne Pink. So that's what this one is. You can 
can see it there. And it's just really happy, doing great this season. I have a bunch of flower buds over here coming in. And I've reorganized and have some very old plants now as well. And I'll talk about those in the future. Now this is Houghton, and you can see it has quite a few flower buds on this old mature branch. And this is Sugar Dragon's parent, one of the parents. Now speaking of Sugar Dragon, I have a bunch of flower buds here. Even down low on the stem. And up high. Some more here. And neon is showing off as well. So here's a neon. Some several flower buds, even down here in the branches. Now there's two more in this section I really want to show you. Well, actually three. Here's G1. So my friend Leo's G1. Just potted this yesterday, believe it or not. And I was able to save some of these flower buds. Now here's a special one. This is Paul Thompson's number seven. I've moved this plant and I have not repotted it yet. And it definitely has a large flower bud that should open in probably a day or two. Now look at this over here. This is probably the thing I'm most excited to talk about today. And this is Paul Thompson's success. And look at that. So I'm really excited to see, is this indeed Haley's Comet that was renamed? Or is it something else? But this one, Paul Thompson lost in a frost, but not before he gave it to a few of his friends in the California rare fruit grower community. So this is success. And then here's one of my chic hybrids as well. Look at how beautiful they are. So here's Leo's condor. It's definitely one of the early varieties to produce flowers. You can see here I had two the past few nights and I cross pollinated them with that frozen sugar dragon pollen. Now there's also several more flower buds here on these cuttings, these mature cuttings. Now I have one up here that I'm really excited about. This is Luke Vleeraker. It's an Ocamponis from Leo's collection. And it's reported to make a very dark magenta flesh fruit. It's really a beautiful plant, some type of Ocamponis from the Puerto Vallarta area. So Luke Vleeraker. Now I also have a few more here. Let's see, Danny's Pride of Fallbrook. This is his mother plant that I dug up and brought home earlier this season. And there you go, look at that. Now this plant's very unique, and I believe it's the real Pride of Fallbrook because the owner of Elk Creek Dragon Fruit that named it said it was like a Nicaraguan that produced a Guatemalan fruit. And that's exactly what this plant does here. I have a few more, let's check them out. Wanted to share today. Here is Natural Mystic. So one of the early bloomers here in the collection, Natural Mystic. And here's one, another one I'm very excited about. And this is 4S. So if you look here, there's a little flower bud here. Hopefully you can see that. And there's actually a bigger one right here. So this is Paul Thompson's 4S. I'm really, really excited to see how this fruit turns out. It's reported to be almost pale pink, almost kind of like Maria Rosa. So the whitest colored f flesh of his series, his seedling series. So Paul Thompson's 4S.
Greetings fellow dragon fruit growers, this is Paul, and today I'm going to show you for some signs to look for to see if your dragon fruit is ripe. Now this is a beautiful dark star here, and you can see the first thing that I look at, and I've learned this from Wallace Ranch, is the cone right here, and I look for any cracks at all. So this is not cracked, it's on there still a little tight, so this can spend some more time on the branches. What I mean by cracked cone is over here is a good example. Here's a purple haze. If you look really carefully right above my finger, you can see that little crack. See it? It's a little hint of pink. And that shows you that this is going to split open and the ants are going to get in there pretty quick. So I like to cut them or pick them when I see a split like that. Now another thing you can do, I have Trisha over here, is the wiggle test. That does work well, but that's a little vague. And you can see this Trisha is starting to turn color. But the wiggle test is you can see it's loose, but also you can twist back and forth. So that's how I do the wiggle test, up and down, and I twist it. So this looks really ripe. I'll probably pick this tonight. And on this one, wiggle test, it's loose, and I can twist it as well. So both of these are just about ripe. Probably give them another day or two. Now another thing you can do, let's go check out El Grullo over here, is what I kind of call the push test on the flesh. Now that's another thing I learned from Julio at Wallace Ranch, is that when it's ripe, you can just kind of push and feel that there's a little bit of, of play, like the, the soft, the, the flesh inside is soft. And so that's another thing you can do. And I can squeeze it right here and feel a little bit of, let's see if I can show you. You can see that where it pushes down a little bit, it's not super hard, so that's another sign that this El Grullo is ripe. Also, the color, and up and down, and I can twist. So this is definitely ripe. I'm going to pick that tonight. Now, color can be a little misleading. Here's some more ripe varieties over here. This is the Unknown Road. But you can see the cone is not cracked. Up and down, it's a little bit tighter. doesn't twist very much. So I bet these can stay on for a few more days here. Here's another one. But they're almost ripe, so I'm checking these every day and I'll probably remove them and harvest them in about two more days. So there you go, I hope that helps a little bit. There are also some things that you can see that some colors are misleading because plants like Rainbow or this unknown one from George Emmerich Jr. that I have, you can see it changes yellow and just these dynamic colors, but it's still not ripe. If you pick it when it's turning these colors, it's definitely gonna be picked too early. Good morning, fellow dragon fruit lovers. This is Paul, and I'm with some of my favorite fruits here. This is Laverne Pink, one and a quarter pounds, versus Dark Star, which is one and a third pound. As you can see. So Laverne Pink, was actually mislabeled as a Laverne Red, and I think it's a seedling. As you can see here, look at the stem. It's definitely interesting looking, and it's more spiny than some of the other Laverne Pinks I've seen out there. And here's a picture of the flower that you can see as well. Now in time, this will get larger. The plant's young, so we'll see what it becomes. But here it is. This was my favorite fruit last season, and look at that color. Beautiful. Wow. Versus Dark Star, which is going to be a little bit different color. But still equally beautiful. Okay. I'm really excited. This is my only fruit off of Laverne Pink that I got last year or this year. So let's see how it tastes. Mmm. Wow. It's definitely, I think it's better than I remember it, I hate to say. It's really, really sweet. It's complex. It has a nice bit of acidity to it. It's a great, great fruit. All right. I'm going to predict it's up near the 20s at least. So let's see.
So 19 and 1 tenth. It's been a weird season, so it probably could have been on the vine or the branch longer. And this thing did get in the 20s last year. 21 and 0.5. Mmm. Wow. I really like this fruit. This is definitely my favorite one to date. Unless... This beautiful dark star does better. Let's see. Mmm. That's really hard to pick. I think I'm gonna have to call it a draw. I mean, it's delicious too. Very different flavor, more like a grape. And the better texture. I would say that the texture of Dark Star is slightly better. I prefer it. Let's see what the bricks sugar content is. Twenty and one tenth. So this large dark star it took the bricks award. Hmm. What about flavor? Let me try one more because right now it's honestly a draw. But these are my two favorite dragon fruit for sure. Mmm. That's delicious. That's delicious too. I'm gonna have to say Thai. They're both unique. They're definitely different. I'd say the texture of this one takes the cake and it's slightly sweeter as you can see. But this one just has, kind of bounces you all around. It, it's very sweet. The texture is really nice too. The seed to flesh content is really great. Oh man. I'm gonna give this a nine. This a 9.1. It's that good. Last season's was a little bit better. I think the weather, and we've had this hot and cold weather, it's affected the fruit this year. So there you go. My two favorite fruit, Dark Star and Paul's Laverne Pink. Just a delicious looking and tasting fruit. Look at this. And Dark Star is no slouch either. Look at this beautiful color. All right, give us a like and a subscribe. Thanks for your time. Have yourself a wonderful day. Take care.